Today is April 6th, 2016, and we're talking to Eddie Becker, who was a, an activist in many different causes. Um, I'm asking the question, Bonnie Rowan, uh, and I guess let's start. We'll start with how you came to Washington. You know, wh what led up to your landing in Washington and becoming part of the activist community? Well, I, the main reason I came here is I had a friend. I had friends here who I'd met. And uh, I'd been traveling around the country and uh, spent some time in um, outside of Eugene, Oregon, some time in Oakland, California, um, hung out in San Francisco, in a little time in Chicago, had, had been traveling all over since I guess uh, the alternative media conference, which sort of began as a fluke. We just landed there and, uh, in 1970. And then I made a bunch of friends there and then traveled around visiting them, going to Canada, coming down into the mid, 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 Midwest, and then heading out west. Tell us what is this conference and where was it? So it was uh, in Goddard College in 1970 and it was all of the sort of like uh, people working in alternative media and at that time underground newspapers, freeform radio and the very nascent burgeoning group of people who were getting into uh, video. So the video freaks were there and another fellow who I met there, Tom Weinberg and and people who were beginning to publish a, a magazine called um, Radical Software, which documented the alternative video movement. Sony had just introduced the Porta Pack around then, and it made making media much easier. And um, people were getting a hold of it and shooting stuff that had never been seen before, because it was inexpensive and it was instant. So you had a fast learn, you know, like with film you have to you know precisely how to set it up and then wait a, a month or so for the processing to get back and it was only a three minute roll. So, so this really changed a lot of things and, and we thought it was part of a big revolution. A big revolution of like changing the way people um, see themselves because now they could really see themselves. Bonnie, can you come just a smidge closer to me. Oh, careful, let me. There you go. Thank okay. You. Better? Yeah. Great. And, and I had some background in electronics because uh, my father was a, you know, a furniture refinisher. And he would take old consoles and he would refinish the wood, and the insides of them would be obsolete. So there was just a big pile of electronics in his place because people were putting in the latest stereo. So I had all of these old radios. And you know, at first I would like, you know, take them apart, smash them, and then eventually I started to plug them in and fix them and get all of these old radios working and li started listening to shortwave radio. So in this very provincial place that I grew up in, outside of New York City, Rockaway, I started to become like a shortwave listener. And, and um, I also like to get stuff in the mail. And so I would write to these stations and they would send me all of this stuff. And I remember when I was like um, probably, I don't know, eight, they called me down to the post office. And they said, look, you got this uh, package here from Czechoslovakia. And I said, oh, fantastic. And they said, but you have to sign this. I said, yeah, where do I sign? They said, well, if you sign it, you're going to get on the list. I said, oh, you mean I'll get more stuff? So, you know, very early on, I was on the list. Of, you know, and so, I, you know, this was like they sent me like some, some, some toys or something just for writing them and telling them I heard their station. And then, I mean, that was the sort of beginning of, of listening to things and trying to find, find, you know, getting, trying to get rid of noise in the signal of these very weird stations that I would receive um, and the uh, signal to noise. So I got into audio, just trying to improve 
the signal to noise. And then when the video stuff happened, they were on, you know, kind of equipment that broke easily. So I could solder and try to improve things and replace stuff that was going wrong. And, and back then the components were pretty fixable, meaning they were big enough. They weren't like, you know, a thousand processes on one chip. It was, you know, very discreet. And, and when things go wrong, uh, you could f basically find out how to fix it. Were your parents political? Maybe on my mother's side, uh, but they always were like telling me not to get on lists because, you know, they were always very cautious. So my mother was in the, 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 the teachers union in New York and my father was, uh, became more and more conservative and, um, you know, was very uh, disappointed that I didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't that great academically and he was always sort of like, uh, undermining my um, confidence. So because of that, I also tended to want to do a lot of research on stuff and, uh, I mean, to prove that I was right. So I, my whole life has been, you know, overcoming a lot of the deficits that uh, I was told I had. So when did you leave home? Let me pause one second. Well, Yeah. I mean, I left home um, as soon as I was 17, as soon as I finished high school, and then uh, didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I, you know, drugs were pretty prevalent and uh, experimented a lot, mainly with psychedelics and, uh, you know, had uh, quest visions and uh, traveled around with mainly people who had Volkswagen buses and lived in all sorts of situations, but would always wind up going to um, underground bookstores or bookstores that had a section where there was the underground press and finding out what to, where to go next and, you know, kind of, you know, being like uh, someone who followed uh, where the center of things were. So it moved around. Were you the youngest of the group that you traveled with here and there, or were they your age? I didn't travel with the group. But the, that you hooked up with? The oh, they were friends from high school, from, you know, from, from where I grew up, and, uh, and then basically doing it on my own. So, yeah, I wasn't, um, I would, I don't think I, you know, it was very different, meaning I just wasn't, you know, well, I couldn't settle down that easily either. I was searching and, um, um, you know, would settle in a place and be with some people and contribute there and then move on, just searching around. And then when I hit Washington, D.C., I think there was enough stuff to do because it had the archives and it had the Library of Congress and it had places that I could go and hang out in. And it turns out my mother was a librarian, so I don't, know if that kind of was the reason I had the patience to sort of just find obscure things out and not, you know, kind of get bored and give up on it. But I always thought there was like an answer that like you could really f find out the truth, that there would be a document or something that would like, you know, inform you. But with, and, and, and also a technical way of fixing things. So. Um, some of my earliest memories was, was going to the main um, libraries in Brooklyn where they had all of the old popular uh, electronics and studying circuits and trying to build them from the parts I had pulled out of these old radios. Wow. How did you support yourself once you got to Washington? Well, um, so I didn't need a lot. I wasn't that much into stuff. I mean, I, I valued books and uh, information more than I did clothes and food. 
and living for less was something I could do, and like you know, getting by with just things that I found in the in the street or in thrift stores was enough for me. So uh, during this period in Washington D.C., um, it was very inexpensive to live. You could you know stay in a group house for less than a hundred dollars a month, including food. So the early places, uh, you know, I could work. Um, Less than, less than a few days. Oh, so, I mean, and when I traveled, I would sell underground newspapers. Wherever I went, I could just go into an underground newspaper, which I would read, and I would... So when I first got to D.C., I was selling Quicksilver Times on K in Connecticut, which... Uh, you know, as it turned out, I, I hadn't really... I, you know, I'd look in the classified for for like jobs, but I hadn't really noticed that the, it was a bomb-making issue. So, and it, it sold very well. <laughs> to all of these executives and I guess guys who worked for, uh, you know, the security forces. But, but anyway, in, in there I found a, a classified ad that said they were looking for researchers. I said, well, that's something I like to do. So this was a source catalog which worked out of the National Student Association building. And beginning there, I, I kind of moved from where I was uh, staying on N Street up to S Street to the National Student Association building. And under this um, auspices of source, it had me calling around, finding out about all of the different alternative media things that were going on. So, so it fit in exactly with what I, what I wanted to do. And what year was this? This would have been in 1970, in through 71. And with them, um, you know, eventually I was introduced to uh, uh, this Italian filmmaker who was hired to start up the community video center at Federal City College uh, through a connection uh, that his wife had. Because when they went to start Federal City College, they went to, I guess, all of these uh, federal agencies. And they said, well, you know, we're looking for someone who could teach film. And, and they, they, they had the name of Luigi Barzini. And his daughter's daughter was married to this filmmaker. So they got this filmmaker to come here. And, uh, but all he wanted to do was work with the, you know, the Black Panther Party and start a revolution. You know, coming out of this hot, uh, the hot autumn of 69, and his films that he was making were kind of the equivalent to uh, Clockwork Orange, but the violence wasn't random, it was focused against the state. So uh, United Artists, which had spent a few million on his second film, just banned it. And so he said, you know, I came here because I could have control over it with this video with this new video revolution. So, so, they, we, so he's, after uh, May Day, 1971, which was a big action, um, they bought a lot. Expand a little bit on that. So, so at, as it turns out, the National Student Association was made up of student bodies from across the country, which had, after uh, the CIA had been exposed in 67, the National Student Association became more, uh, let's just say, activist. And uh, David Ipshin and Margie Tabankin and a bunch of other people who were associated with it uh, were you know, basically reflecting the mood of campuses, which was very um, anti-war. So the students had decided that they would do a people's peace treaty. And then there was an action that was not so much led by the National Student Association, but people participated in this to sort of shut Washington down as a sort of gesture to say that they didn't want to participate anymore in this war. They were at peace with the Vietnamese people. And so thousands of people came to Washington. And we covered it with video. There were, uh, you know, 20 or 30, maybe upwards of 50 folks, eight different groups from the video freaks, 
people from Mass University of Massachusetts, from Antioch, Columbia, um, who came to Washington with porta packs. And then we all went up to New York to the Video Freaks loft. And over a period of a week or two, we edited it down to an hour. And this was one of the, one of the Video Freaks projects. Um, so that, that, that's kind of an interesting, it was, it was a very formative uh, experience for me to, to work on a collective process, which was not very easy. I mean, everybody is, has different stuff and they're feeding in. And of course, the equipment was very archaic, meaning that you went from these porta packs to a one inch machine. And in order to get everything running in sync, you had to back up the tape seven, at least seven seconds so the motors are running and then at the right moment, someone had to press a button right at 7 say They had stopwatches. And, you know, uh, very, uh, yeah, very quick response. But anyway, we, we did that. I had shot in, at the Justice Department, and the police charged and just started to beat people up. I mean, it was, and it was to mace people as they were sitting. Um, you know, it was a very tough polarization at the time. It was, there was a, you know, it's very different now because of the people who were the conservatives were very much into a very strong centralized government, while the uh, alternative people were into community control and decentralization, and they didn't trust the central government or the. You know, it was not like now, which is totally reversed, where. The conservatives have betrayed the liberals as wanting big government, and the conservatives are more for like a local autonomy or something. You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah. So that was made a video, and that, and and then um, and then I stayed with doing uh, working over at Federal City College. We tried to make an example of what it would be like to have cable TV in Washington D.C. Washington, D.C. didn't have cable. And so we would take the equipment to all of the different housing projects and show people what they looked like on TV. And, and for them, it was a big turn on. They'd never seen themselves on TV before. I mean, you know, people have, and, and it was very interesting to, to see that. And it was very difficult to edit, though, because the equipment wasn't there. So we would just try to shoot 20 minutes without uh, making it so that that 20 minutes stood by itself. And we called it process. And it was, you know, for filmmakers... Editing in the camera. Editing, well, <laughs> if you can, even, even the camera clicks were kind of difficult. Because, of course, the problem was that there was this different spacing between the audio heads and the video heads. And so it wasn't that the two heads were on the, on the, on the helical scan uh, rotating heads. So you had these glitches that happened in, and you have to come down in the vertical interview, interval, or the helical interval. It wasn't, it wasn't very dynamic, and also you couldn't, so it means you couldn't do insert editings very easily. You, you had to have uh, an idea of everything from beginning to end. You have to have everything laid out, right? Which was very good training now because I'm still shooting and I'm always looking around for the next shot, mm -hmm. right? And what the transition is and, and to try to keep it so I, I have to do as little editing as possible in these kind of variet shooting variete and on the street. Um, so... Where are all those tapes today? Give me one second. Where are all those tapes today? Some of them I have. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Can you say that again? Where, where are all those tapes today? Where, so, I mean, I have some of those. I, have, I, I held on to some of the Mayday videotapes. Um, and also a few other videotapes that had uh, significance. Uh, and some of them have been, tra many of them have been transferred, and I have them on another format. A lot of them got left at Federal City. Most of them, most, I think, I think most, most of those uh, got, 
taken by Federal City College. And uh, they closed down the video project. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the relationship, eventually it got back to them, the Justice Department that you know, was, had all these projects with the Panthers, or at least you know, they saw us as facilitating a movement that they were trying to uh, strangle. So they closed down. So now about what year is it? So, um, so this soon after, so we're talking about 72, into 72, 73, and, um, and Roberto has to leave the country. I mean, he doesn't have to, but he, you know, he's going to go back to Italy. So he said, you know, we'll go back and, uh, you know, you can write the technical part and I'll write the, you know, and, and I'll write this story about how we can use videotape to transform the society using kind of this idea of uh, Paulo Freire where a community can get control of itself if it controls its own communications. So people making their own videotapes and discussing things is a way that they can become animators, you know, so using this idea. So it was, it was interesting. And then the Italians had this long history of, of uh, neorealism where, you know, the idea was that like a, a director would, would sort of find actors who were sort of like the people and portray this and have them portray this story. Whereas we went in and say, well, we'll train you how to use the equipment and then you make your own story. So after the book was published, one of the regional governments, Emilia Romana in the north, uh, hired us to train uh, local groups in Bologna and around Bologna. Bologna is the center of Emilia Romana to make these programs. So in Italy, we had this big project. In, I think it was in the in the summer of '73, to um, you know, we worked with uh, worker councils, with uh, uh, tenant organizations, and with student organizations. So these were already organized groups, and they would come in for these lectures by the theoreticians every Sunday morning that the region set up and that Roberto would conduct. And then as that was happening, I would be working with a group who would record those events. And then during the week, they would have a discussion about what they wanted to do in their own community or in their own, you know, for the student movement. Or, and then we would have to also incorporate the, what they called the diffusion of that information, which meant since we didn't control the, the air, that was controlled by the, the, the television networks, and there was no cable, we had to set up these playback systems in you know, the window of a store or in the square, and then that would be where everybody would watch stuff. Yeah, that was pretty, pretty remarkable, and the, it was great to be in Bologna. Bologna was a great city, and it was run by the, the left. It was run by the communists. When I got to the town, there was this huge Viet Cong flag on the wall of the city. And this was like, wow, this is fantastic. And, and uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out, well, what is this communism, you know, what it is? And they said, well, we got this, like, here, try, try this. And they gives me a piece of salami. And, and he said, yeah, we make this. And, and we have this, like, uh, uh, co cooperative where everybody brings in their salami and then we, we market it. And we, you know, it was all of this stuff. And he said, here, try this. And I said, that's vinegar. Some, it's a sweet vinegar. Yeah, yeah, it's made in Modena. It's very good. You want to, you know, we're going to market it to the world. And, and I said, yeah, you're going to sell vinegar? It was, you know, you know it was that uh, balsamic vinegar. So it became world famous. So this was how I understood communism. Mangia bene. And, and everybody looked, they all were immaculately dressed. And they, you know, and I was like this you know, guy with the long hair, and I was, you know, just dressed, you know, very inexpensively. I mean, they were all very immaculate. They looked like the people I'd been demonstrating against. So I, I also had to sort of wrap my brains around, like, 
and a lot of them back in the, you know back then was still had the memory of World War II and fighting fascism and and a lot of the stories I would hear would be war stories about uh, the resistance movement and how they took over and why they took over and what that meant to them. So. So then, why did you come back? So so I had been, you know, because I didn't really go to college. I had been. Uh, classified 1A and they had the the lottery and I'd gotten a low number 32 so I had to but they couldn't find me because I was you know traveling so eventually I got indicted and uh, I think Giuliani uh, took over as uh, district attorney in the southern district of New York he was assistant to Hogan or whatever that guy's name is and they went after people who were part of a, a movement to, um, you know, so I was, I was openly anti-war, so that, those, that sort of put me on the top, one of the, one of the thousands of people they went after. Uh, and uh, so I had to return to this c country, to the United States, and, uh, you know, deal with this. You, getting lawyers and figuring out how to sort of plead. And, and the movement was sort of in disarray when I returned. I mean, by 74, 75, um, I don't know how it would be. It wasn't the same, you know. It wasn't as if um, it was as active. The war was kind of almost over. And, that, and so there wasn't as much of an anti-war movement. People were, you know, focused on other things as well. So, I mean, the last big demonstration was really in 71, at least as far as I could tell. Maybe there was some other things like, as a, but there wasn't much of a national movement after that. And Watergate had happened, and, uh, and Nixon was an, ending his career, and Ford had come in. And so when I went to stand trial, um, I think it was by then, uh, you know, I was found guilty, but I was sentenced to two years probation. And, um, and then as soon as, I guess, Carter got in, he gave amnesty to everyone. But there was a time when it didn't look like I was going to go back to uh, Italy until I had finished this. And it seemed as if there were certain restrictions on my travel while I was under probation, because I had to report. I had to report to this guy who said the reason he was a parole officer was so he could get out of the draft. And you know, he just had said, I really admire you, because I, you know, I should have done what you did, because you know, I was strongly against the war. So, so I really didn't have to show up there that much. and. Um, and so, um, so the, the, my friends in Italy, they were still concentrating on trying to get a better way of showing their videos and to, to mount a TV on top of the truck, you know, you know, and show the tapes that way in the square. And, um, and so they, they said, why don't you go to the National Archives and see what you could find in terms of like, uh, you know, we heard the Allied Military Command had set all of this stuff up so that they would, uh, you know, that's how it got to be where there's the, the Rai television, R-A-I, and it was controlled by the Christian Democrats, which had dominated the political reality in Italy since the end of World War II. And, you know, before that, there was Mussolini and the fascists. And before that, there may have been, uh, th there was a monarchy. So they went from monarchy to fascism to Christian Democratic Party. But to, to create the Christian Democratic Party, they had to you know, build it after World War II. And even though the, uh, the, the, the um, partisans were in a much better position to govern, uh, they participated just soon after the war ended, but then were totally excluded by uh, the, the Allied Military Command, which made sure that uh, the communists and the socialists wouldn't participate. 
And, you know, that was a sure thing for the South because that's where the Allied military command was. But in the North, the partisans had liberated the North. So the police and all of the politicians had already been kind of um, taken out. And the partisans were in to local government, which is why, you know, Emilio Romana and, and Tuscany and, uh, and the, the northern regions were more progressive. But anyway, so, so I started to go to the National Archives, and it was after Watergate, after uh, the beginning of a kind of suspicion that the, that the government had basically gone off the tracks in terms of intelligence operations. And there was a, a pushback, uh, the Senate investigations and all of that. And, and the Freedom of Information Act had gone into effect. And coincidentally, the, the bulk declassification of materials from World War II and afterwards were going through. So when I first started, I could see up to 1947. And there was you know, two sets of files. And all of a sudden, they, they rolled out some other ones, which was the classified files. So I started to go through that. And then 48 and 49 <coughs> became available. And there were very few restrictions on any of that stuff. And into, in, 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 intertwined within the State Department material was all of this kind of the setting up of the CIA and all of these operations to guarantee the Italian elections and these mechanisms that were kind of like the, the setting concrete of the Cold War and of covert operations and use of propaganda and uh, arms supply, you know, what to do in the event that the, it, the communists win in Italy, the stay behind groups were in there, the, the, the mafia uh, kind of picking up old fascist and Nazi uh, intelligence people. Uh, and the most important thing, which was the alliance between the Central Intelligence Agency and the Vatican to create uh, a propaganda and uh, the Christian Democrats' way of winning elections, which was a big success in Italy. They were able to win the elections and get out the vote and, and, um, and control the airwaves, which was why it was important for the rise. So I, d I kind of just, you know, had all of this stuff and I was constantly sending it over there. And they got very excited and they put together this book, which was published in 1976, called The Americans in Italy, Gli Americani in Italia, by Roberto Faenza and Marco Fini. And, um, and you know, it, uh, it caused a big stir. They talked in these documents about how this was the Italian model that could be implemented in other countries that had big Catholic populations in Europe and in Latin America. But, you know, and it was very successful and they were able to influence the labor movement, the elections and, and all of that. And then they try it in Vietnam because Diem was part of this Catholic movement. He participated in the Holy, um, the Holy Years and had been infused with this kind of anti-communism, new crusade. But as it turned out, of course, uh, Vietnam only had a 7% Catholic population. Um, it was a disaster. I mean, the, 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 that's when the, the monks were emulating themselves, burning themselves up because of the corruption and the ingrainedness of a, of a, of a Ziem whose Catholicism comes, came from, of course, you know, a colonial experience from France, so he didn't represent the nationalists. But they had gotten so successful at running elections that Ziem had gotten more, than, more votes than people who were qualified to vote. That's, <laughs> that's, how, that's how good they were. Well, now, while you're kind of in this intellectual world and working with the Italians, at the end of the day, did you go back and you're hanging out now with political activists here in Washington? So I started to work making a little money with journalists, with other historians, found out that, oh yeah, you know how to use the archive, why don't you find this stuff out, working on other projects. At the same time, I was you know, working at Fields of Plenty, which was a food co-op, because I didn't need much to live, I just 
needed time and I, you know so I, I had to do something for money and I would get in some you know big projects sometimes but mostly um, little projects that were interesting um, the video work back then was kind of in between it had gone from this half inch reel to reel to this humongous three quarter inch equipment which I worked with so the video groups were back then um, public interest video was that in the 70s? Yeah, maybe beginning in the early 70s, I guess, public interest video. The equipment was just too much to own and too expensive. I mean, normally I'd pay 2000 for the equipment for port pack but this stuff, you needed a minimum of uh, 10000 just for the equipment and another 20000 to do editing. And uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, in my budget, because I was always kind of doing it on the uh, low end. Um, and then it even became more expensive with Betacam, so it went from three-quarter to Betacam. Uh, but eventually I wound up at CNN in 1982, right? And I came there with a, a whole different experience than most of the other people who were hired because they could, they were mainly hiring uh, um, couriers because couriers knew how to get to places quick. And the, the, the people who were doing the hiring were all of these people, fire chases, who would chase fires. And they always, they had like walkie talkies and beepers all around their belt. And they would go off like, you know, when something big was happening and then they would monitor the police bands and they would get into their thing and get to the, get there and get the, you know, get someone jumping out the window or, you know, this was who they hired, these New York guys who were, who were into that show. But you were here in Washington. I was here in Washington, yeah. And, um, and the union was coming in and I got involved in that and uh, uh, working with Daniel Shore and... But I, you know, there was always there was always a deeper story, and I was doing all of these like, just just hauling the equipment around and being the the, the, the audio guy. I mean, that's something I could do, and um, and uh, so the context of that was, you know, go, going to the White House and miking Reagan, and then seeing all of a sudden having worked with at Fields of Plenty, all of these people from Nicaragua and then them coming into power and then being um, they're being, being uh, be watching all of a sudden the mood change about Nicaragua and then beginning this kind of covert operation uh, the Contras and that whole pattern and then my friends from Fields of Plenty said why don't you come to Nicaragua and you'll help us uh, set up the TV and the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. You know, they had some money and some equipment and an air-conditioned place. So then I spent uh, about, I don't know, three months in Nicaragua. Uh, and then I ran into, in Nicaragua, these Canadians from Montreal who were funding projects there to do media. And they, you know, saw me working and then um, when I got back to the States I hitched up to Newfoundland and then got to Montreal and visited them and they said well you know we got these projects in Africa you know so in one year in 1985 I was in uh, with the uh, Salvadoran FSML FSL the uh, Far Mundo Liberation Front in El Salvador, in Peru, doing a documentary about Sendero Luminoso, and then wound up at the end of the year in, uh, in uh, Eritrea. And, um, and all of these, you know, I mean, the, the Sendero people were kind of weird. It uh, wasn't so much into them. But, uh, they were always, you couldn't, you know, they were just killing people and stuff. It this was, was in? Peru. In Peru. Yeah. So we were working on a project about the eight journalists who were killed in this very, very remote hamlet near Ayacucho in Peru. 
and they were murdered uh, reportedly by the peasants who were told that they should be killed by Sendero. And they were trying these peasants, and we covered the trial. But the families of the journalists say it wasn't the peasants who killed them, it was the police, and they had all of these theories about, about it. And uh, it was just kind of a, a very strange thing. So I worked there, you know, doing, because I could fix the equipment. I was, I was sort of someone who would be good on diff difficult shoots, whether it was charging the battery from the, charging the, you know, running the lights and recharging the battery from the sun or from the battery inside the car as we moved or, you know, not blowing the circuits out because they're using 220, 50 cycles and we have, you know, 110, 50, 60 cycles, uh, you know, just having this kind of experience of um, not breaking stuff and if it breaks I can get it back together again. Now, did you always, or at that stage of your life, think of Washington as your home and you traveled out from it? Yeah. And then you'd come back? Yeah, there wasn't any, I mean, I, I kind of would have, you know, I was thinking maybe of what my life would be like staying in Bologna, which I liked a lot. But, uh, you know, I always came back because there was always a, a political struggle here that I felt a part of. There was always something to, to, you know, make better. So it was always an idea that the, there's, you know, there's a lot of noise and, and I'm trying to, like, get the signal. Yeah. So what were some of those local Washington issues? Well, so with the skills that I had gotten from doing research in the National Archives, and I, I could pursue a story and go, you know, find the corporate records or the business records of people who were involved in stuff going on, foreign agent registration, lots of repositories here. I focused on a bank that was going to move into the neighborhood in 1976. I, put my research skills looking at uh, perpetual savings and loan and, and, and started a group called the Perpetual Research Group. And we, we went out and took the, you know. Well, no, no, tell people where it was. On the corner of 18th and Columbia Road. Right. Yeah, I was walking down the street on 18th and Columbia Road. I was walking down the street and there was a guy sitting in a beach chair with a clipboard just marking stuff. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, uh, you know, the bank wants to move in here and we got to, you know, uh, register the um, traffic so we know that there'll be enough uh, traffic to support a bank. Because apparently, before the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, you had to justify that there would be enough people. They didn't want too many banks or financial institutions in the same neighborhood because it would, like, threaten the other bank's business. So they we're doing this. I know, well, where is it going to go? Oh, yeah, you know, in that corner there, which was a lot that had, we don't want a gas station in it, uh, the big sign that said, BP, we don't want you here. And I said, well, that's interesting. And it was around the time that the prices were beginning to change very dramatically. I mean, a house in Adams Morgan that had sold for, you know, between 20000 to maybe... 40,000, now it was 60,000, 70,000. This is in 1970, 76, 75, 76. And so, um, and, and taxes were going up on property and rents were beginning to change and, and, and we were living in a, a group house and the, the whole idea that this house would be sold from out from under us was also threatening, right? So I went and, you know, started to get the annual reports for the bank and then I got the board of directors and I went to the, you know, the who's who's and the financial institution. I went down to the controller of currency, which has a very sweet library with all of the banking institutional stuff and started to compile lists of what all the board of directors were doing and then went to the Washingtonian section of the library, which listed the Lusk's directory. It lists all of the home sales. And then the bank had to submit their 
reports to the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. So that talked about how much money they were lending into the community compared to the amount of money that they were getting back in people's savings. And up until like 1974 or 73 or 72 or something, it was like this. This was the amount of money they were loaning and this was the amount of money that they were um, holding. Hold, getting from the neighborhood. There was a disinvestment. They were, they were getting money from the neighborhood, but they were lending it elsewhere. But within a year, it had changed. And they were getting as much money as they can from other places and putting it back into the neighborhood. So there was a, all of a sudden a change in policy. There was no longer redlining or disinvestment, but they were using the money that they were getting from outside to sell the homes of people who were, had been renting. So this was the beginning of a wholesale displacement. Um, and then the, the banks, the, the, the directors were in collusion with like uh, the uh, significant collusion with the um, Board of Zoning Adjustment to get zoning changes. And with public leaders and with the Board of Trade and there was all of these overlapping directorates. And, um, but the neighborhood had a chance to basically uh, make a position, make a position to give statements before the Federal Home Loan Bank Board to object to them, to question them, to, to say, you know, we want some kind of a deal. And it turns out that the, uh, uh, a Nader um, lawyer, uh, John Brown was his name, was very interested in banking policy. And at the same time, the Adams Morgan Organization, which was a pre pre precursor to the Advisory Neighborhood Commission, was also interested. So that was Frank Smith. And, and, and so we did the, the, we did the research. And we, you know, we participated in all of these hearings. And the bank eventually conceded to make certain loans into the neighborhood, which uh, you know, helped some buildings get their status. I think uh, Seton Street, a lot of the neighbors were uh, part of that. And Perpetual was also making money available to co-ops for a little time. Was it uh, part of that was around the time that the Beverly Court, but I, the Beverly Court had it together, I think, before then. But it, it helped. Um, you know, they, they would prefer, they would have preferred to have gone with a different, uh, to do condominiums rather than co-ops. And we specifically said that, you know, co-ops were more democratic. And anyway, so, um, so that was the perpetual thing. That was, that was an interesting thing. To see how local banking worked and how displacement had, you know, redlining and then displacement. And there was a, a really a huge wholesale displacement of people happening, happening as these apartment buildings were being sold and everybody was being evicted and it was a conversion to a, um, a condominium where none of the original people were. Now people have a little, you know, they'll get 20,000 or something. But back then, you know, there was also an effort to get um, federal money to help with the down payment and then to pay back stuff that, uh, that was, would be reasonable for people. And, uh, and when Carter came in, he instituted uh, uh, banking laws that helped with the Community Reinvestment Act. And it made uh, loans available to people who before had been excluded from getting loans. I mean, they had to have a job, they had to have, you know, the right credit rating, but they were in neighborhoods that had uh, earlier on um, been disinvested in, right? When, I know when you bought your place, you probably had to pay cash? Just about. Because you couldn't, couldn't get a loan. Couldn't get a mortgage. Couldn't get a mortgage. 1973. 1970. So this was, uh, you know, around that moment. And uh, you, you probably didn't pay more than 40000 yeah. All right.
So yeah, that was a, that was a description of, uh, of that process. So when people ask me, oh, you know, aren't you shocked by what's going on in Adams Morgan now? I said, well, it used to be a third Hispanic, a third black, and a third white. And now it's completely different. Uh, not so much a, a multi, you remember the multinational kind of Monica of it. Now it's, now it's like other neighborhoods saying we don't want to be another Adams Morgan. Because of the I know bar this scene. Is making a big leap in time. Right. But I think telling us the story about indie media. Oh, indie media. Because we're at 50 you, minutes, FYI. Okay. Five, Great. Because now we're doing after the 60s. Right. And where your initial activism kind of led and what interesting things. I mean, I would think that was the most interesting story. Indie media. Right, where you and Joni had your, isn't that what it was called? So we had our place, yeah. So, but, but I have to kind of explain yeah. what it was. So, uh, you know, so I'd, I would go from researching to being part of uh, TV shows, like the 90s show, which came about in the uh, late 80s to kind of focus on what the 90s was. So I, I made con connections with all of these alternative media and then started in when the new equipment was introduced which was Hi8. I bought into Hi8 and then into um, uh, the next generation of video equipment which was even more fun, the uh, DV which was a tape but it recorded digitally whereas Hi8 was analog so now we had a digital tape and then um, and at that moment uh, Seattle happens. So this is 1989. And then the people from Seattle want to come to Washington, D.C. Tell them what Seattle was. So Seattle was uh, the World Trade Organization and it was all of the environmental movements on the West Coast who had seen basically uh, huge deals. Can, I'm sorry, can you say that beginning of that sentence again? We just got a uh, distortion for some reason. So, Seattle, Seattle yeah. Uh, environmental organizations coming in to say, we don't want to have these huge deals where, you know, in, in, in exchange for la la uh, um, uh, loans to build infrastructure like roads, you're going to give us your rainforest. You're going to give us, you know, all of the, you know, we're going to dam up this thing and make hydropower and, and flood all of this natural area and, and displace indigenous people. Uh, we're, you know, you're going to, we're going to strip mine your, your land, you know, so all of these people who were very well placed could make a fortune. It had been these types of loans from the World Bank and the IMF and also the World Trade Organization was participating in it. Was, was leading to more poverty. And this is exactly the, the opposite of what this was, this, uh, these projects were supposed to you know, have done. It was supposed to empower people. Instead, it just concentrated wealth and, and displaced people and had a devastating effect on the environment. So these were people who'd been sitting in trees. I mean, these were the tree sitters and these environmental activists who had uh, you know, been opposing the mining and strip mining and, and uh, they, 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 they wanted to, to do something. And, and certainly the beginning of this new media revolution with the, with the internet and the ability to stream and to do something that had never been done before. Because normally in alternative media, they all fell apart because people would argue about what would be on the front page. You know, well, I think this story, and I think that story, and, and this is more important. The, my issue is more important than your issue, and this is sort of like that. But with the internet, it was like everyone could post. There was no, and anybody could be an author. And, and it was based on like, okay, whoever, you know, thought this was good, you could click like, and that would promote this, move the story up the list. It was a much more democratic means of communication. And, um, to cover a demonstration like that without having to publish a newspaper or to do any of that stuff. Although interestingly enough, most of the successful indie medias wound up publishing newspapers and having that process. 
but um, and then uh, and so experimenting with all of that. So the indie media we set up. And who's we? So um, so we got they got a call from a couple of people who who you know. So I knew a little about DC having been here. So it was a matter of finding a big space, finding housing near that big space, and then finding some, you know, getting, getting a phone line in and a, uh, having it where it's already cabled. So we went to Blagden Alley where uh, um, Blagden Alley, back then, there was a, a video group that worked out of there. Eric Gra Gravely, um, Vox, Planet Vox, and before that there were the Beta Punks who used that space. It was a big stables, and it had two floors, and on the first floor was this huge space that was uh, used as a, an art gallery, and I think for a couple of thousand dollars we rented it for, for a month, or for three weeks. And all of these people just brought in their equipment and there was a room set up for audio, and there was a video space, and there were just all sorts of computers where people would be knocking things out, and, and uh, you know, everybody had cell phones, so they didn't need a central phone, and that, and that would be used to cover this demonstration that was going to shut the annual meeting of the World Bank and the IMF down. And, uh, and it did. I mean, it had a, a very significant impact on at least the messaging of the World Bank. Because you remember before, they all used to ride around in limousines and they would like be stretching and they would be super stretchers. And, and, uh, and, and we were saying they, the, the message of this thing was you're spending too much on yourself and your projects aren't appropriate and you're, you know, you're, you're destroying the environment and uh, you're disempowering people and you're setting up these uh, very narrow elites and living off of the sweat of the people and, and destroying nature in the process. So that messaging changed a little for the World Bank and the IMF. Yeah, so that was uh, part of it. So, I mean, my role was just to sort of just find the space and the logistics and to sort of, you know, try to um, find local people I knew who could be hosts, you know, help people. Because our role in Washington has always been sort of to welcome people who had messaging to do and to hook them into feeling comfortable and like that. And I, you know, it was, it was considered a fairly successful effort. We weren't raided, although we were feared that because the police were uh, very you know, they, they, their tactics were to try to disrupt as much as they could and to, to look for anything they could to... And, and just days before the action, they had raided what they called the Convergence Center, which is on, off of Florida and 14th Street, and closed that down. So there were an organization of the demonstrators, That's and right. you were the organization that was covering. That's right. So you were here, and right. And so you were on the web. What was the uh, extent of your coverage? The extent was uh, significant, meaning that I mean, whoever wanted to plug into it could get the story about what was going on. A lot of imaging and some video, and a lot of audio, and a lot of first-hand accounts. And a lot of, so, so that was like a huge, a huge presence. And once that was over, then indie media moved into your house? No, no. Once that was over, we closed it down. Within a day, it ended, and we just dis totally dismantled it, and made it seem like it would go away and the cops wouldn't hassle us. And we, we moved up again to New York and did an edit called Breaking the Bank that went over uh, public access here and got the police really pissed off because it just totally showed how uh, uh, stinky they were and how they handled it. And that, you know, along with the imaging we had, a lot of videotape of, uh, of the police breaking the law 
you know, spraying camera people, anybody, arresting people wholesale, beating people up without pro provocation, uh, was used in a lot of cases. Now, a lot of people who were tackled by the police were charged with assaulting an officer. We had the videos to, to disprove it. So we provided all of that to the Partnership for S S uh, Civil Justice and the other groups who were defending people. And it, you know, it got, and nobody, at the end, nobody was uh, found guilty of anything, as far as I could tell. So, uh, and then, and that really uh, pissed them off too, especially uh, Ramsey, Chief Ramsey. And, but, but, and the police were into getting even with folks, you know, they were really being rough. And they were setting up situations where they would um, entrap people and then arrest them and charge them with, with all sorts of stuff. And that basically worked against the police. I wasn't, I wasn't arrested, I wasn't uh, a part of that, but eventually what happens is that the city council and, um, and even the Justice Department uh, and the judges came down and said, you, you know, this is free speech, this is, people have a right to demonstrate and if it's noisy or if it's disruptive, that's part of the, that's part of the process. Democracy is messy and since then the police have been um, a little better behaved, I think, you know, with Occupy and afterwards, with Black Lives Matter. I mean, normally they would provoke a confrontation, the police would provoke a confrontation. And we had that, we documented all of those provocations, well, not all of them, but, but now they're, you know, when I see them, they're, they're kind of, you know, stepping back, right? If we're getting toward the end, is there something, if you think about, maybe trying to think back to 60 to 75, something where there was a big lesson, what I learned was, or what we all learned, or what we all saw? A big lesson that we all learned. I don't know. Well, Maybe it's I think the big question. lesson we all learn is that there's no, there's not, every generation learns it on their own. That they do it by making their own mistakes and they do it by, um, you know, either, you know, trying to, you know, and when, you know, when, when I look back at the generations that had preceded me, you know, they had, and, you know, when I was working on the Itali Italy book, there were things I would find in the archive of trade union movements who would, like, question American foreign policy towards doing what the U.S. was doing in Italy back in 47, 48. People connected in with Henry Wallace and all of that. All of those people had been, you know, the FBI had gone after them. They were part of this Cold War Red, red Scare and severely um, limited. I mean, they, and m many of them were totally out of politics because of that. Um, so there was that, we had to invent it all ourselves and, in the, and we were pretty experimental. I mean, I think in the 60s and 70s, we knew what we didn't want, but it wasn't clear exactly what we wanted, you know, and each different group comes along and they're doing all sorts of new experiments and uh, you know they're trying different stuff and uh, you know and I used to be pretty adventurous I would be on that tip and that, that edge and you now I'm kind of uh, mm -hmm. just watching from a distance so let, let people make mistakes and let them have adventures thank you thank this you. was fascinating <laughs> Oh, thank you. Wow. Can I get a still? The, uh, the, so in this book, it talks about um, the fact that this one of the documents, people started in the movement started wondering if there was infiltration and to what extent, because it seemed like the FBI suddenly was like one step ahead of people or just knew a lot of stuff that, that people couldn't understand and people's houses were getting broken into apparently and they were just finding um, they, they weren't being robbed, but documents were being stolen. 
So obviously something's going on. So then people decided to rob this place in Media PA. And one of the documents, one of the first ones apparently that was uh, sorted through and identified by the group that did it was said, was a memo from an agent and it said, um, we want to um, make the people in the movement feel like there's an FBI agent behind every mailbox and, f and increase the paranoia amongst the people. Yeah. What is it like to realize that, or to, to feel like your government is trying to do that? Does that have any place in a free society? Well, I mean, you know, I, I got pretty good at spotting the more obvious uh, people who came through in the media. And uh, we always sort of figured that they would send people in for intelligence gathering. Like, where, is, where are you going to meet? Where are you going to march to? Uh, are there any people in your group who will, you know, represent a threat? I mean, and, but then they were, we became concerned because they would participate in meetings. Mm -hmm. They were the note takers. And they, were, and they were also like, could they vote on, you know, what we're going to do? How much participation was it allowable for the police to be part, part of? And, um, you know... They were always the most helpful people. They always had a car. They could, like, you know, you need money for this. We could find it. You know, they were. They brought cookies. Yeah, <laughs> they, and they all, they, they were always on time, and you know, very. You know. So I asked the, uh, and but we were a journalistic organization. We weren't planning to, to demonstrations. We were covering them and getting the word out, and you know, still trying to keep some integrity. So we went to the lawyers at the Partnership for Civil, and we said, why don't we do a FOIA and find out whether there are any guidelines that infiltrators are given. The guideline would be like, you can, you can collect stuff at the meeting, but you can't vote. You can't you know, do a story and write about someone. You can't, and then it could get into this kind of COINTELPRO stuff. You can't basically start a factional fight or denounce someone for being this or that. I mean, how, you know, what are the, and, and, and they wrote in, and they turned out the District of Columbia government said, we don't have guidelines. And they took that to the court, and with that, the police had to release a list of all of the infiltrators they had had. Not all of them. All of them, we had basically identified, the ones we had identified, they had released. How, how did it feel to, realized that the go it was sort of, if not formal, uh, at least de facto policy of the government to undermine people and uh, try to s essentially stifle their right to dissent? Well, I mean, it's, it's a total imbalance of how a governance should work. We should know how people who are um, operating on behalf of us are making decisions. And this is what the, the problem was with uh, government records. They destroy them and they, they make, they cover up their own, you know, this, they, they're the ones who don't have any right to privacy because they're, you know, civil servants, they're government servants. We have a right to privacy. They don't, mm -hmm. right? If we do something illegal, they can arrest us. But, I mean, covering, being journalists or covering a, controversial issues um, isn't illegal and there should be no reason why they would be doing that. And they like doing it. I mean, they, they would hang out with young people and they would, you know, go to parties. It was a lot different than like, you know, infiltrating uh, uh, street gangs or hanging out with uh, dangerous people. Mafia. Yeah, whatever. Whatever they infiltrate. So, um, generally they were fairly easy to spot though, at least for me. Every, other people were more trusting, but after a while, like, you know, someone writing down, like, who's going to do the pet sitting. <laughs> you know who they are, right? Yeah, you yeah. Know. What, I have one yeah. other question. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And then also, if you ask someone, well, you know, how come you're here? Why are you doing it? And, and you know, you, you talk with, you follow up on the questions and they'll talk about, well, you know, I really want to help the children. So, you know, they're kind of, they haven't thought it through. 
But after someone has been around for a long time, it's very difficult. I saw one infiltrator basically even pattern her speech, mm -hmm. going from like a very you know, suburban kind of talk to a, a kind of urban style of talking. Um, which was a, just remarkable how Did far you? people would go. I remember in the, in, the, in the heaviest days of the anti-war movement, 69, 70, 68 to 70, I would say, um, the, the infiltrators and the groups that I happened to be in almost always were very obvious because when we went to a demo, they threw something. <laughs> and we all knew that it wasn't, it didn't make sense after a while to throw bottles or rocks yeah. at police. But there was always somebody who was willing to do that, and usually they were an infiltrator. Mm -hmm. You know, because they were looking provocateurs. Right. Provocateurs, yeah. word, right? I have one other question about a. Well, it's about Nixon, I guess, about mm -hmm. his if you all don't mind. Um, I'm read the more and more the more I read about that period. Um, it sounds like he was well. He first of all, he's tried to rule by division, like pitting every people groups against each other all over. That was he, his he, entire he, strategy. Nixon. Oh, Nixon. Okay. And and it seemed like he responded to the growth of the um, anti-war movement to become this mainstream, like most of the people yeah. at some point were against the war, it seemed like that motivated him to prosecute the war even harder. Did you get that sense at that time? I did. Like he responded, he went the opposite way of what the people seemed to be wanting him to do on purpose. Well, clearly on purpose. But... Um. Well, they were losing the war. Yeah. And uh, the only option he had was to devastate, uh, you know, to, to bomb, because he couldn't use troops near the end. So he just would bomb more. I mean, at one time there were 500,000 troops. I think that was under Johnson. But I mean, he had, he had Agnew going around, and I guess Buchanan was writing really nasty stuff for him to say. Right. And suddenly they're calling people on the, uh, young people demonstrating against the war bums at home yeah. and then they're essentially calling them heroes if they're in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah, right. Similar age, similar uh, backgrounds, but one guy's in Vietnam, he's a hero and a guy on uh, protesting the war's a bum. Yeah. Suddenly you've got the vice president calling you names. Right. And and was that a new-ish thing at the time or was that, and did you all It was feel just that? this huge polarization that happened and yeah. he was talking for the silent majority and he was trying to mobilize them and and it was a generational divide, yeah. and it was a real uh, kind of them and us type of thing. And I don't know if it's going to happen now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, with is Sanders versus Trump, maybe. I mean, this is. I mean, at least it's sort of playing out in electoral stuff. I mean, I, you know, get along with people who think like that. Mm -hmm. They're not. I mean, people are all over the place. Everything is turned upside down. Meaning that, like the people who are into big government, think that the liberals are. You know, I mentioned that yeah. before. Um, so yeah, but the, back then it was very. You know, uh, that was most profound during the Nixon years. It started during the late Johnson years, but it, the, the population wasn't so polarized. You know, yeah. I really, it really started with Nixon, and they stoked it. I think the Nixon people stoked it. You know, I mean, the whole thing about. The hard hats, you know, setting them the against the, the guys who went there. You know, yeah. most most soldiers were blue, blue collar guys. You know, nineteen years old on average, yeah. right? But Nixon tried to set set them, you know, set everybody up so that if you were right. screwed, then you were. And it turns out they just released this document about how the war on drugs, yeah. Ehrlichman's admission that it was really meant to. You know, go after the hippies and the anti-war people yeah. and the black, Can you explain and that a black bit? power people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're looking. The, the, a lot of the hippies, a lot of the anti-war people, were into pot, LSD, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, with that they could put people, in, you know, disrupt the movement by by, you know, implicating them in drug, drug consumption and right. and using as well as in the black community. Is a way of putting a lot of black people yeah. in jail too. And it eventually morphs into a huge business for the, for the uh, oh, police yeah. and a, and I mean and for prisons and for an yeah. industry is developed, it becomes yeah. this multi-billion-dollar thing that's costing us all our future. And mm -hmm. you know I just participated in a demonstration the other day in front of the White House, yeah. which was a 
one of the pinnacles, one of the highest experiences of my life, um, where you know they're trying to get the descheduling, get marijuana off of this like the most dangerous drug list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so things go on. We're, we're now trying to regain it. That, that ugly head of that kind of uh, polarization also took place before the Iraq War. The, yeah. It's 2.53. You, you got to go. Hey, Eddie, you know? Yes, please. All right. All right. Wow, thanks, Eddie. This is great.